From a defabricated solar-powered garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, how to leave gainful employment behind and get in on this whole new DJ thing. <laughs> and now, the podcast host who has no use for DJ tips because he thinks Hall & Oates is a cereal, Pete Dominic. It's not? If not, it should be. Hello, my friends, and welcome to today's show. Thank you, Pete Co., for another great intro. And it is Thursday, if you're listening on Thursday. <laughs> Tonight, I'll hang out with you. I'll be hosting the Stand Up with Pete Dominic subscriber hangout as I do every Thursday night at 8 p.m. I hope you stop by. It's always a lot of fun, and I'm sure it will be tonight. So just a reminder for that. If you're not a subscriber, then we'd love to have you. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic right now. I have two excellent guests, two big name guests, two of the most brilliant people and most beautiful writers, both on the show. Separate interviews, which is kind of coincidental because last night they were together because Jeff Charlotte has a new book out and it's so, so good. And Virginia Heffernan was at the Brooklyn Public Library with Jeff Charlotte last night interviewing him for his new book, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. Jeff Charlotte joins me today and Virginia Heffernan joins me as well to talk about her new amazingly reported long form piece in Wired magazine about the semiconductor industry specifically in Taiwan and why it matters. She went there and wrote this amazing piece that I wasn't sure I'd be interested in, but I guarantee you when you listen to my conversation with her, you're going to want to read that article as well. My interview with Jeff Charlotte starts at 16 minutes, and Virginia and I start talking about 52 minutes in if you want to skip ahead. But first, it's time for the news. Well, yesterday seemed somewhat uneventful. I mean, we were on indictment watch and continued to be today. But I do have a few stories that are worth mentioning. For one, the Manhattan grand jury that is expected to indict Trump didn't even meet yesterday. So that's a, a big deal. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to Russia wrapped up after three days. And despite the Chinese pronouncements that the Chinese leader's three-day visit to Moscow was an effort to mediate a diplomatic end to the war in Ukraine, the Chinese president appeared far more focused on countering American dominance, according to the New York Times. The Los Angeles school strike highlighted the surging cost of living, the second day of a three-day work stoppage in the nation's second largest school district, has left classrooms for 420,000 students sitting vacant while school service employees picket for higher wages. The workers' union said that half of its members who earn an average $25,000 a year had to work a second job in 2022. And uh, of all the 420,000 students asked, they were psyched about the days off, not knowing what it meant at all. So but they talked to a lot of those students and they seemed to be happy that school was, was canceled. Not caring about the teachers. I just made that up. Uh, the country of Uganda passed a strict anti-gay bill with punishments severe as the death penalty, which is absolutely horrific. And the culmination of a long running campaign to target LGBTQ people in the conservative East African nation. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken urged Uganda's president, a close Western ally, to strongly reconsider the implementation of this legislation. And I would strongly reconsider anybody going to Uganda or doing business with that horrible authoritarian oppressive regime. But the big story yesterday seemed to be the Fed raising rates and stressing its focus on trying to cool inflation despite recent bank turmoil. The U.S. Central Bank raised interest rates by a quarter point, the ninth increase in a year in one of its most closely watched decisions in a decade, the move was viewed as an attempt to wrestle down price increases while communicating an awareness of financial threats. The chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, said that officials had, quote, considered pausing interest rates to avoid further aggravating the banking system. But recent economic data has strongly indicated that further increases were needed. Well, a lot of reaction, of course, to that being the biggest story yesterday. The Fed raising its key interest rate 0.25, continuing its crusade against inflation. But they did say the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. So, you know, everything's fine. 
And Senator Elizabeth Warren yesterday was on CNN with Jay Tapper to discuss the Federal Reserve's decision to raise interest rates as attempts to fight inflation. So I thought I'd share that with you because she doesn't think everything is fine. The December Washington Post column said that this is not the Warren presidency, but it's certainly a Warren infused presidency, meaning that the president, President Biden, is taking a lot of your suggestions and trying to enact them into law. Have you ever directly told President Biden that you think he should fire uh, the chair, fire Jerome Powell? And who would you like to see replace him? So I'm not going to talk about private conversations. uh, But what I will say is I've made it very clear as publicly as humanly possible that I didn't think that he should be reconfirmed as president, as chair of the Fed. And I think he's doing a really terrible job. And he's doing a terrible job on both fronts. Remember, there are two, only two jobs for the Federal Reserve chair. One is monetary policy, inflation. I think he's doing a very bad job there. And it's risking pushing our economy into a recession. His other job is regulatory oversight. And he has spent five years weakening regulations over these multi-billion dollar banks. I predicted five years ago the consequence of that kind of weakening would be that we would see these banks load up on risk, build their short-term profits, give themselves ginormous uh, uh, bonuses and big salaries, and then some of those banks will explode. And that is exactly what has happened on Chair Powell's watch. You just mentioned the prospect of a recession. Do you think the United States is headed for a recession? I think that that is where Jerome Powell is trying to drive it. And he's got two different ways he's doing it. You think he's purposely trying to drive it to a recession? Well, what he's trying to do is get two million people laid off. And one of the things that we need to understand, he wants to raise the unemployment rate by more than a point within a single 12-month period. We have done that before in this country. In fact, we have done it 12 times before. And out of all 12 times, how many times has it resulted in a recession? The answer is 12. So that's the direction he's trying to push this. That is a danger to our economy. It's why I said five years ago, I think he's a dangerous man to have in this job. All right. Elizabeth Warren, just giving you one perspective there. And now here's a different perspective on a different issue. This is Tucker Carlson roasting himself live on the air for your entertainment and enjoyment about 30 seconds. For the Chinese, it's just so easy. How do you win a war without fighting? By getting your adversary to kill himself. Well, how do you convince a strong, self-respecting, powerful country like ours that has ruled the world for 100 years to do that. Turns out it's pretty easy. You take a collection of dumb, desperate people in middle age, hoping to keep on to their stupid TV jobs. You add scripts and some hairspray, and they just repeat the lies for you. All right, there you go. Tucker Carlson talking about himself. (laughs) All right, now let's shift gears and listen to yesterday the testimony up on Capitol Hill of the CEO of uh, Moderna. He was getting grilled yesterday. Moderna CEO defends 130 U.S. 130 dollar U.S. COVID vaccine price at a Senate hearing. First, here is Senator Rand Paul making an accusation that uh, the Moderna president disagreed with. And then we'll listen to Bernie Sanders. Is there a higher incidence of myocarditis among boys 16 to 24 after they take your vaccine? The data I've shown actually, I've seen, sorry, from the CDC actually shown that there is less myocarditis for people who get the vaccine versus who get COVID infection. You're, you're saying that for ages 16 to 24 among males who take the COVID vaccine, their risk of myocarditis is less than people who get the disease. That is my understanding. That is not true. Is there a- Well, is it? I don't know. I have no idea. We'll find out. And now let's go to Senator Bernie Sanders. He's the chairman of this committee where the Moderna president was testifying yesterday in Capitol Hill in the Senate. And they sparred over what Moderna owes the federal government and the price for the vaccine. Here is that. The United States government helped you develop that vaccine. It is a huge consumer. Are you prepared to substantially charge less for the vaccine to the United States government and our agencies? Given the situation at hand, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have no idea of the volume that we need this year. We have very increased complexity. Yeah, you have complexity, but you have money for stock buybacks by the billions, and you guys became billionaires. That doesn't seem too complex to me. 
All right, let's head over to the House now. Here is uh, Congressman Ted Lieu, Democratic, uh, Democrat of California, calling out Republicans over amendments to the Parents' Bill of Rights, which, if you haven't heard about this, is a really terrible piece of legislation that Republicans who now run the House are trying to pass and that states are passing left and right across the country, conservative states, that is. Here is uh, Congressman Ted Lieu yesterday. Republicans rejected when Democrats tried to make this extreme. Let me tell you, what are the amendments that Republicans rejected when Democrats tried to make this extreme bill better? Here are some amendments Republicans rejected. Republicans voted no on an amendment to remove lead pipes from schools. Republicans voted no on an amendment to ensure kids had access to healthy meals. Republicans voted no on an amendment to help keep firearms out of schools. Republicans voted no on an amendment to prevent schools from monitoring students' menstrual cycles. Republicans also voted no on an amendment to prevent the censorship of the teaching of the Holocaust. This is an extreme bill. It's going to do horrible things to students' privacy, and it's going to increase books that are banned at school. All right. So uh, good, important legislation to just it's not going to if it passes the House, it will go to the Senate and it will die and. Even if it passed there, the president would never sign this, but it's definitely being passed similar pieces of legislation at the state level. And it's certainly the direction that the Republican Party is going in this country and Ted Lieu doing a a bang up job there uh, criticizing it. And while we're in the House, finally, I've got this entertaining piece of audio for you. This is a congressman named John Joyce. Of course, he's a Republican and he loves uh, animal milk. He loves cow milk. And here he is. He's pissed that that, that they're uh, comparing or that that milk from plants and, and nuts is, is called milk. And maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe he's got a point. But what he doesn't have is a point about nutrition and milk being being healthy. Anyway, this is 2023. And this is a Republican congressman talking about the importance of a nutritious part of your <laughs> your day drinking cow's milk. Bones, muscle, brain, and vital organs all rely on products like whole milk for healthy development. The whole milk that cannot be replicated by inadequate imitations that are found in plants and in nuts. Our students deserve better than these fraudulent products, and we cannot allow almonds or soy to be passed off as dairy to American families. It is time to ensure that whole milk is once again available in every school cafeteria. Oh, no. It is time to pass legislation like the Dairy Pride Act and the Whole Milk for Healthy Kids Act that will support, support families, support the growth of students and support our dairy farmers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I yield. All right. Well, I'm guessing Bones, that he gets a muscle, tr- tremendous brain, amount of money and from vital organs. those same dairy farmers for his campaign. That's Representative John Joyce. Now, listen, I'm not going to come over here and tout these other forms of milk for you because like almond milk, it might be delicious, but it requires a ridiculous amount of water. It's definitely not good for the planet. And I don't buy it for that reason. I also don't like almonds and uh, I'm not noble at all. But <laughs> but I mean, there, there are problems with the other the other forms. But come on, uh, going out on defensive of, of whole milk i mean the reactions to this were unbelievable of course like a huge percentage of, of, of people can't even digest milk right i mean lactose intolerance it's a real thing right and cow milk is is totally fortified it's artificially fortified with vitamins it's not essential to humans a lot of kids can't drink it but they didn't tell us that growing up and we just had stomach aches as we went back to class i don't know why i said we i had no problem with milk but a lot of kids definitely do my daughter does so they're not going to let us uh, let our kids choose what to read, what they wear, their names, their pronouns. But now they're going to be forced to drink milk in schools. The dairy industry is losing money because of alternatively uh, healthier non-dairy products. And they no longer have a stranglehold on America's diet. And and that's a good thing. It's not a great thing for farmers. I, I, I get it. I understand. I grew up uh, just all around dairy farms in upstate New York. And I have a lot of sympathy for that. But we really shouldn't be. Eat, eat, drinking that it is delicious as it as it might be. We certainly shouldn't be forcing it on kids, right? Am I saying anything that's too controversial? I don't think so. Put that dude in a room with a hundred people who have lactose intolerance as he's forced to listen 
as each describes in detail what happens when they've digested any dairy product is one comment I saw. All right. Well, that's all I've got for you in the news. And now it's time to get to both my guests who probably didn't even need it. I mean, getting to them is, is the big part of the show. I really outdid myself today. Two of these, these two people are two of the most brilliant, articulate, excellent writers, period. They are just such great writers. Matter of fact, Jeff Charlotte is the head, I think, of creative writing at an Ivy League school, Dartmouth University. And we'll start with Jeff and then we'll uh, get to Virginia Heffern. And Or you can skip ahead to that because it begins at 52 minutes in. But what can I say about Jeff Charlotte? He is such a a great, great writer. He's become a a friend as well, I got to say. I'm I'm a big fan of his and always have been. I met him a long time ago when he... Join me on the SiriusXM show. He has been a contributing writer for Harper's and Rolling Stone. His work has appeared now in Vanity Fair, where he's a contributing writer. New York Times Magazine, GQ, Esquire, and so many other media outlets. His interest in religion is a lot of what he's known for. He's the executive producer of the five-part Netflix series, The Family, which is based on his books, The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power. And C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. His new book has been reviewed in both The New York Times and The Washington Post. Great reviews. I think you're really going to like it. I love Jeff. I love talking to him. He's awesome on Twitter, by the way. But definitely go get this book right now. Follow Jeff on Twitter at JeffCharlotte1T. And go get The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. Jeff Charlotte joins me right now. Oh, there he is. We've got him. The legend lives for as long as possible. I hope you live forever. Jeff Charlotte, congratulations. The new book is out. Scenes from a slow civil war. I feel like I've been talking to you about it as you've been writing the dispatches in Vanity Fair. Thank you for joining me. Congratulations. Thank you, Pete. Good to be with you again. And two amazing reviews, maybe on the same day, from the Washington Post and the New York Times, comparing you to Joan Didion, the great American writer, a pioneer of journalism in America, who she herself has compared with people like Hunter S. Thompson and Tom Wolfe. And now look at you, Jeff Charlotte. I'm in the lineage. I'm in the lineage. I mean, yeah, you know, I'll tell you, like, here's what that's interesting to me about those two reviews. I mean, I like them. It's good for the book. But I've been writing about the right for 20 years. And in the beginning, I, I can tell you, first, first couple books, New York Times wasn't going to touch them. They're like, oh, this is alarmist. Come on, Obama's president. Everything's okay now. And so it to me is like both bad news and good news that these papers of record, this, you know, the big establishment papers are catching up maybe too late to, mm. oh, this is this is real. One of the reviews sort of says, like, you know, Charlotte spends a lot of time with right wing extremists and like, um, so if you're a hammer, every, you know, right. everything looks like a nail. But the problem is there's a whole lot of nails right now. And and that's good to hear from those papers. Um, may the rest of the coverage of those papers catch up <laughs> uh, with their with their book critics. Very well said. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's I saw that note. I think it was a New York Times review. And it, it was interesting to to kind of, you know, oh, well, I wanted to pose it to you that the, I think the review by Joseph O'Neill says that about you. It's like. You talk to police officers, they think everybody, there's crime around every corner and everybody's a criminal. So that's what you, you deal with criminals. You don't, you're not dealing, you're not going out on calls when a man comes home and gives his wife a hug and kiss and plays with his kids. There's no reason to, to think about that. You go to Trump rallies. You have uh, immersed yourself of, as a journalist with so many of these people embedded into their homes, into their movements. So what do you say to that kind of accusation that maybe you've been too close, too immersed, and you're giving the movement too much credit? Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, so the book's called the undertow and, and, and the big title essay, the long, it's the, the biggest section of the book. I'm just driving across the country, the United States. And, um, and I'm following this kind of January 6th insurrection trail. And I'm, I, I didn't go, I start at a rally for Ashley Babbitt, the insurrectionist who was killed on January 6th, um, when she's trying to crawl through a broken window with a knife. But then after that, I wasn't, looking, I mean, I was keeping my eyes open, but I didn't have appointments with January Sixers and insurrections. I talked to the people I met traveling through, and this is what they told me. <laughs> Everyone I spoke to about civil war, there, there was two answers. There's only two answers about civil war, and they were both yes. Uh, one, yes, and it's a sorrow, and one, yes, and I'm ready. Bring it on, right? 
And that was astonishing to me. If you had said, I've been covering the right for so long. And if you had said to me 10 years ago, I would have said no. Well, when no. you say even more specifically, you can go into this if you want. The, the second yes, when they say yes, and I'm ready. And then they bring you into their house and show you a billiard table covered in guns. I mean, they're. Yeah. Yes. And I have all of I think what you mean by I'm ready is I have my own armory. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the yes and of improv, and the and is, um, you know... Uh, Grenade uh, launcher. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's a guy named Rob Brum, who is uh, the leader of a, a militia in Marinette, Wisconsin. Um, and, you know, he had various numbers of how big it was, you know, he claimed. So it was sort of an heir to something called the Michigan Militia, which was quite big. It's in several states. He, you know, he'd say 7,000, 6,000. It's probably smaller than that, but it's a lot. And... Um, he, I, he invites me into his house. He's got a, a, a you know, a, a Glock on his hip. I'm already trespassing on his property because I was taking a picture of one of his flags. And so, you know, you don't refuse that invitation. I come in and right. He's got a billiard table and it's covered with guns. That, there's a dirty Harry pistol. He's got dirty Harry's pistol. He's got AR-15s. He's got boxes and boxes of ammo. He's got night vision goggles. He's got heavy duty body armor, not the body armor these posers wear. This is the stuff that you can shoot at with, with a, a serious gun and, and stand up, which he trains with by wearing eight hours a day. And he says, I say, can I take a photograph? Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's got his cat, his cat Twitch. You know, you don't want someone with a lot of guns naming their cat Twitch. <laughs> And Twitch is walking around the table and he says, yeah, you can take a photograph. He even turns the light on. And he says, all the things you can see are right. legal, you know, and, and, and he loved doing that move. Right. Like I asked, he was a January sixer and the corner, he had a TV streaming. He's a videographer, weddings and insurrections. And he's streaming his January six footage. And I said, were you carrying at January six? And the same thing is like, Let's just say I wasn't mugged in Washington, D.C. Because in the white imagination, if you go to a majority black city, you're going to get mugged. Yes, he was carrying. He was carrying at the Capitol. Um, that's what I believe. I think that's what he's saying. Um, and um, but it was all a hint. And but what was on the table was so. I think scary. that the criticism, not, not it's not really a criticism, but the it's a fair question. You know, how large the movement is or how extreme yeah. the movement yeah. is, but you traveled across the country for a year. You and I have been uh, staying connected and, 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 and 20 years and we yeah, had 20 years. And the, the point is you didn't have to go uh, looking no. No. for someone who supported the idea of a civil war or had a lot of these extremist ideas. You just had to go to the gas station. You just had to go to the church or yeah. just about anywhere, any bar, and you could find people. It's not like you were going, trying to go to Libya and, and, and you know, or even Afghanistan or, or somewhere and find an Al Qaeda member. And you had to keep asking. and It was a dangerous thing to do. You just had to be in America, it would seem. You have to be in America. You know, there was a, a situation in Omaha, Nebraska, um, a, another militia church. These churches that have their actual own militias, a sort of a, a medium sized, almost mega church. Uh, a fairly prominent pastor, although I didn't know that going in, um, guy shows up with Mike Flynn and Lauren, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert and so on, preaches this ferocious uh, sermon, including, I don't know how he found out I was there, but he starts waving his Bible at me and says, report on, tell your lies. We welcome Well, you were dressed as an Orthodox Jew. I think that was probably one of your and, mistakes. Yeah, I should have trimmed the paces before I went in. Um, and uh, Jesus. I mean, I never... I, I never go undercover, I never, I, I, but afterwards, you know, um, a church usher comes out with a, a militia guy, full armor, guns, you know, the whole thing. And I'm arguing with him because I'm in the parking lot. I'm not even in the church. I'm like, I can stand in the parking lot. He's like, no, no, you, you can't. I'm like, well, why are you so upset? I've got a pencil and you brought a man with a gun and the usher, the church usher, you know, the person who shows you to your seat leans in and says, how do you know I don't have a gun? And to me, this is the American question right now. You go to the gas station. How do you know I don't have a gun? There's a gas. I, I meet a nice family at a gas station in Wisconsin. Lovely folks. You wouldn't looking at them. You would never guess. Just get to chatting with them. And um, uh, they, they're gun owners. I am, too. It's not a big deal. But they have uh, armed up. They're at 36 guns now. And um, they've always been 
anti-abortion, but now the dad is dreaming of two things. He's dreaming in graphic detail of the murder of babies and then in even more graphic detail, which he describes to me, of the murder. He and the righteous men, when the time comes, are going to exercise on these abortion doctors. He looks forward to their execution. Um, he dreams of their execution. Now, I don't think it's going to happen. Like you say, like the size of the movement, these guys are not, these guys are sparks. They're not the menace. You know, the, the, the Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin militia is not marching on Washington. They're sparks. Um, but the danger, you know, the fire that they can light is, is, is potentially big. Uh, and you have been warning about this forever. I want to just give you your, your Rodney Dangerfield moment if you want to take it, because I feel like you've been writing this forever. I've been reading it forever. You have predicted things. Those things have happened, including Trump uh, becoming president. And yet, yeah, you're getting the book contracts. You're a writer at Vanity Fair. You, your new book is out. It's published by a big outfit. You got reviews in The Washington Post and New York Times. So one might argue you did, do get respect. But I think that's maybe even and not enough from a certain segment uh, yeah. uh, of, of like media, other journalists, your fellow journalists, and even them, many of them have issues with, with or at least with gradations, if not a lot, with your work and with your views. But certainly policymakers haven't been listening. And, and I think the mainstream hasn't necessarily been listening. They made your, your series into a Netflix series. It certainly wasn't perfect to the book. But what, how do you feel about what you've been screaming and writing about as well as anybody could possibly ever write uh, in your generation? Do you feel like y you've been given that respect? And if not, wh who's not giving it uh, to you and your views? <laughs> You're queuing me up there. Um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned um, the Netflix series, The Family, um, uh, which uh, is about a long time fundamentalist organization, Washington, a kind of elite fundamentalism, internationalist fundamentalism, um, and uh, sort of made common cause with Trumpism, much to my surprise, actually. I didn't think they would cross that bridge, but they did. And um, they host something every year called the National Prayer Breakfast. Since 1953, every president, all of Congress, and then delegations, mainly of defense ministers and oil men yeah. from around the world come. This year, they broke it up. This year, and and not in time for all the foreign delegations. Foreign delegations are pissed. They spend huge money to come there and lobby. And now they're suddenly told that they don't get to go. And a lot of it has to do with a reporter named Jonathan Larson. And if you haven't had him on, you should have him on. He's terrific for something, uh, the Young Turks, but he's, he's not the TV show. He just is relentless in looking at what these guys do, how they're involved in various coups around the world. Hmm. Um, and he sort of picked up on my work and followed it. Last year, Nancy Pelosi did not go to the National Prayer Breakfast, giving freedom to Democrats to not go. It's falling apart. I love some of the interviews. They said, you know, uh, is this because of Charlotte's work? And the family's uh, answer was, no, no, absolutely not. We were totally going to do this anyways. Um, that's the best answer. So, you know, that's the respect I want. I, I, the respect I want is I want Forgive me. I do. I, I mean, I, this is a which side are you on moment. I, I want yeah. the bad guys to back down, to stand down. The respect of, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a long, a long road. When I first started writing about those guys, people said, that's crazy. That doesn't exist. Washington Post, you know, I was like, that can't be. And I'm like, here are the documents. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even just, they exist. That's all I'm saying. When I think we talk now about the threat, of civil war, which I don't think is an inevitable. I think it's maybe even not yet likely, but, you know, uh, how do you feel, uh, you know, oh, it's not likely. Your chances of uh, uh, um, fatal cancer are only uh, 30%. <laughs> you don't feel great, right? I think the media is now increasingly divided. You know, whenever I see someone talking, whenever I see someone talking about who's worse, Ron DeSantis or Trump, I know they're missing the point. I know we're back in 2016. Whenever I see someone saying, Nikki Haley is returning the party to its moorings, then I really know we're back in 2016. <laughs> Nikki Haley, who just the other day says, did you see this? 90% of kindergartners are under the control of critical race theory. No, I did not. I did not see that. Yeah. Yeah. She said, and, and white, so that means 90% of white kids, she says, are being taught to hate themselves. And, and, you know, do we need to say that this is false? And do we need to say that she knows it's false? No. Um, my governor in uh, New Hampshire, I live 
I work in New Hampshire, live in Vermont. Uh, Chris Sununu used to be one of those modern Republicans. So yeah, forget him. And now come the rush of anti-trans, anti-queer, anti-teacher laws. So that's, that is the slow civil war. That's happening. Women are dying because they can't get uh, reproductive freedom. There's already death in the slow civil war. People say, will there be violence? There is violence. Every weekend we see skirmishes between uh, fascists and, and drag drag story hour defenders, armed men on both sides standing there with AR-15s. That's a war. It's a cold war, but it's a war. I was thinking today and I wanted to just get your take on this. What, what do you call Nikki Haley <clears throat> or even Sununu now? Um, we could mention plenty of others who I'd, I'd throw Paul Ryan in there who espouse things they don't even remotely believe as a way to get votes or even get uh, appearances or, or publish things like I, I don't think that that's normal that that they espouse these things. And I think you can see them changing their views in in real time. I mean, Mike Pence, uh, lots of them. I, I think they're just very hollow. They're principle and they'll say whatever it takes. But I think that matters a lot when it comes to winning elections. Ron DeSantis, it, 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 say whoever you want. But a lot of Republican leaders, they don't believe Half the shit they're saying about these conspiracies, about vaccines or whatever, but they say it anyway. What is that called? Because that's not conservative or liberal. I mean, well, look, we're we're in the dream politics of fascism right now. Um, And when you're saying that 90 percent of white children are being taught to hate themselves and that this is a crisis and that's your most moderate candidate, that's fascism. That is and these and dream politics are not really concerned with the real or with the facts or the position, right? Trump, you know, was supposed to be arrested yesterday, and he he got us, he got the media covering him all day. I, I, since I've been covering Trump since 2015, I I get all of his emails, multiple emails and texts a day. You can't opt out, you know. It, it's very much check in, never leave, and I. I uh, but I do want to follow them. And several days before Tuesday, he starts emailing. I don't know if you saw this. He's like, friends, this may be the last time I speak to you. Um, I mean, he was thrilled with the martyr, the martyr myth. And I do think like that's like, you know, people say, oh, these Republicans are hypocrites. To be honest, I don't care about hypocrisy. Look, if, if, if I've got a Democrat who's going to do health care for all because they think it'll get them votes, but they don't really believe it because they're capitalists. Fine by me. Oh, I, I think the same could be said. The, the reverse is I don't care what Donald Trump does to women or things or whatever, as long as he appoints these Supreme Court justices. Right. Isn't that what you heard all over the place? I don't care who the messenger is, as long as they're going to do this. Well, I think a lot of them do like what he does. To women. I think part of well, yeah. part of Trumpism and, and, and the book, I use this term, the Trump scene that I borrowed from my friend Jeff Ruoff, a filmmaker. And the age of Reagan went from 1980 to 2016 which is to say U.S. government, didn't matter who was in office, Democrat or Republican, we were on fundamentally, he had, in the same way the FDR, the New Deal, you could almost argue went from, you know, the 1930s up to the age of Reagan. Now we're in the Trumpocene. The undertow, the thing that was pulling us out there, that was always there, but Trump opened the floodgates. Now that we're in the Trumpocene, it doesn't matter if it's Trump or DeSantis or, or, or whatever. And on the one hand, yes, um, for the pragmatist, it's who he appoints. For Mitch McConnell, it's who he appoints, right? But I think for so many people, like Ashley Babbitt, the sort of central figure in this book, there was license. There was license for for for, for white supremacy, license for misogyny. And I want to say this, and I think people hear this maybe with too much sympathy, and that's not what I mean. A lot of people were struggling against that. Ashley, you know, was very proud of being a two times Obama voter. Her favorite presidents in American history were Trump and Obama in that order. And they they wanted to be better than they were, right? And we all want to be better than, than we are. Trump comes in. The way he the Trump he heralds the Trump scene is a politics of like, stop resisting. Wouldn't it be great? Just think about the sex. I think you're trying to be better. You're trying not to be misogynist, right? And misogyny infects everybody. Whether uh, it infects you and me, especially, but infects infects women, infects infects everybody. Um, what if you just gave in? I think about a woman I met at a Trump rally. An old woman looked like a nice grandma, a real sweet character. Leans into whispers to me about Hillary Clinton. She says, 
don't she look like she'd been rode hard and put up wet? Ugh. That's misogyny. And this woman, you could see the pleasure. Her husband, a nice grandpa, was talking about, you know what? I want to get a hold of a reporter and I'm going to beat the heck out of him. And his wife says, oh, Gene, it's like it's like they're young again. <laughs> in, in, it's like they're young again. Make America great again. Um, back to an imagined age of hate. There was also an age of hate that continues on. Right. But I think I think. Uh, that's why I sort of resisting, like, you know, like the Republicans are hypocrites. That's, you know what? Hypocrisy is not the problem. Trump being overweight is not the problem. Um, uh, Trump being tacky is not the problem. Ron DeSantis being stiff is not the problem. Nikki Haley being a liar is not the problem. The fascism is the problem. The fascism the, is the problem. Don Jr. doing coke, not the problem. I got lots of friends who do coke and they're not fascists. Um, the fascism is a problem and the left keeps getting distracted. And um, what is, what does the left get distracted with? I mean, even me, like, you know, this latest video, did you see this video of Don Jr.? And he was doing air quotes, but he just couldn't stop. And he was so, I mean, he seemed, uh, you know, he was speeding and it's just like going like this. And yeah. if you play it on silent, yeah, um, it, it looks like he's having like a bunny conversation or something. Um, and, it got so much of liberal and left Twitter talking about this. I, I retweeted it too, right? Not the problem. Look, if he was doing this and saying uh, corporate power and we need health care for all and we need real climate thing, great, right? It's not his agitation. It's the fascism. And I think, I think that's, you know, that's sort of the undertow of the book is that fascism is sort of, it has great gravitational pull. It really does. And, you know, so many of the people in the book that I encounter, they weren't always fascist. Ashley Babbitt wasn't a woman to call Evelyn and a chapter called TikTok. And, you know, she was a hipster lefty in Austin, Texas. And then she suddenly she's ramming her car into other people's cars to save, look at me, Don, Don Jr., save the children. Um, Do you this think is gravity? Yeah, exactly. Do you think, though, that, that people who are fascists or people who are racists or people who are misogynists? know what that means and know that they are considered that by smarter people who write about them and think about them? Because I don't think a lot of people who uh, practice fascism and support and are supporting fascism understand history or, or what fascism is. And if you call them a fascist, they a wouldn't be insulted and B wouldn't even know what it meant. And they hate anti fascists. <laughs> they do hate that. Right, right, right. Um, how dare you call me a fascist? But you know what's worse than anti-fascist? Um, uh, the interesting <laughs> thing is more and more of them actually do know what a fascist is, and especially among the right-wing intellectual elite. Um, and that's pretty interesting. And that's trickling down, as it always does. So that militia leader in Wisconsin, he no, he wouldn't call himself a fascist. His daughter, who had a, a Nazi tattoo on her back and was a great fan of Putin, she was a little cagier about that. Uh, he was certainly okay with fascists. He could live with fascists. And I think part of the slow civil war, too, is more and more people abandoning the idea of democracy. It used to be, um, and it, this still is to an extent, right? And the far right says, no, you're not democracy, we're democracy. Now, more and more, a lot of them are saying, and the intellectuals are saying, you know, what's so great about democracy? Do we really need democracy? Um, we need a strong hand. Once you got the strong hand, once you got the cult of personality, once you've got not just violence, which has always been a part of the American story, but pleasure in violence, explicit, I'm going to beat the hell yeah. out of a CNN yeah. reporter. Now we are into classical fascism, not the glib way, but classical fascism, like the great scholar Robert O. Paxson uh, describes it in his very valuable book, Anatomy of Fascism, or, or Jason Stanley, the Yale philosopher, describes in his book, uh, how fascism works. Um, we're not using the terms glibly. Um, this is the real thing. And it's finally here. You've named your first and final sections of the book for Harry Belafonte uh, songs uh, by Harry Belafonte and, and Lee Hayes. Why would tell me why you did this? Tell me about the first section, the opening. Cause I want to make sure I didn't sell too many books. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's like, really like, oh, man, I want to know about the Trumpocene. And, 
uh, and then what's, a, what's the first sentence of this book? Uh, once, more than half a century ago, he was the handsomest man in the world. And it's about Harry Belafonte. And it's a long chapter about Harry Belafonte. I'm like, what? You mean the banana boat guy? Is he still alive? He is. And you get to the end. My God, if you get to the end, Lee Hayes, who's he? Well, if you've ever heard If I Had a Hammer or On Top of Old Smokey or so much of the American songbook, you've heard Lee Hayes who was writing the songs that Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie were singing. I needed to book him to frame the book with hope, but it couldn't be cheap grace because I don't, uh, the last line of the book, which is what I knew I was writing to all along. This is, is the first thing I wrote and, and I knew I was writing to it. It's a line from this guy, Lee Hayes, this great American songwriter, um, who was in many ways a brave man, in many ways not. And um, he he understood fear, and he's describing, he's driving through the Arkansas night with some labor organizers, and they've been chased, but they start singing together. And he says, for a while, it was possible not to be scared even. And I'm like, that's it. That's the hope we've got. Take those moments. Take Harry Belfonte. Both Harry Belfonte and Lee Hayes, here's the hope I have for you. They're both defeated men. Better souls than me. Great artists. Um, Harry Belfonte, I think one of the greatest. Um, those songs, by the way, the Banana Boat song, that's a radical song. Uh, and Harry knew it. He was always working the code, thinking, how do I get this message across? Deo, Daylight Condom and Want to Go Home. It's a work song. It's a fuck capitalism song. Hmm. And um, uh, Harry, though, was very central to the civil rights movement. He knows that that, that didn't happen. He knows that it didn't succeed. His friends were killed. They're gone. He's an old man. He's been smoothed and sanded away. We think he's a novelty song, uh, you know, writer. Uh, people forget that. So you take, pay attention to that, right, though? These are great souls. They were defeated. For a while, it's possible not to be afraid even. That's Lee Hayes. Harry Belfani, what do you do? You play your song again. You make it your own and you give it away. You keep going. The struggle is long. And this is this is the thing to me. I think the left is also caving to the right wing's framing of crisis, the crisis of democracy, the crisis of, of climate. Oh, man, the struggle is long. And that's why it begins and ends with those guys to remind us of that. You was um, uh, uh, that's so well said. Uh, and. In The New York Times review. Who, who is this again? Just lost his name, but I got the, the part he writes. A subplot of the book is the author, that's you, Jeff Charlotte, the author's fragile mental and physical state. A middle-aged man who survived two heart attacks. He suffers from anxiety-induced high blood pressure and travels with pills for his cardiac health. He's also in mourning for his beloved stepmother, whose ashes he transports in the car. He freely admits to his frailties and foibles, refusing to refusing the standpoint of how to or characteristic of literary predecessors such as Joan Didion and V.S. Now Paul. I'm butchering this. Charlotte's authenticity and urgency as an essayist stems from his spooked, vulnerable persona, which confers on him a moral credibility that an ostensibly neutral writer would lack. What do you think of that paragraph accuracy about you and your writing and your ethos your anxieties man he gets me um <laughs> and, and and it's true and uh, with the one fact check i don't have high blood pressure but i do travel with my meds um i'm here in new york at the offices of the publisher norton and i've got my meds with me i think that's also why i wanted to open and it, it's why the folks so many of the folks i speak to are broken people right yeah and some and many times their diagnosis of their condition is correct their prescription when it's fascism is wrong, but I am fascinated by brokenness because I live in it myself. As so many of us do health wise, I fear for my children. I, uh, I have a, a queer trans child who was, uh, suffered from, you know, a lot of mental health stuff. Um, and who was very aware of the news and looks at the fact that, um, you know, to the question of like, Oh, aren't we really past this now? I just have to look at it. And I say, well, um, you know, my, my kid is being criminalized in state after state. I live in Vermont, work in New Hampshire. They have a, they have an interstate school district. So uh, elementary is in Vermont, high schools and New Hampshire. In elementary school, no, you can learn about whatever you want. You can learn about the history of slavery in New Hampshire. Increasingly, our school district is being sued by right wingers. Um, I don't know, you know, some about these kinds of politics, um, 
uh, is, um, you know, you have to be careful. Schools all across New Hampshire are stripping down all the rainbows. No more safe spaces. Parents, uh, right wing parents are demanding lists of every attendee at Gay Straight Alliance clubs. Lists. They're drawing up lists of those whom they consider moral deviants. Now, I'm not going to be hyperbolic and say they're going to kill these folks. On the other hand, we did just have the biggest conservative convention, CPAC, where the big applause line was eradicate transgenderism, eradicate genocidal speech, genocidal practice, collecting. I have reported from Russia where this uh, where violence began in 2013 and, you know, the DeSantis playbook was pioneered by Putin in 2013 against queer folks. Um, The don't say gay bill. That's Russia. uh, I report from Uganda where they passed genocidal bills. Um, uh, I don't think it'll come to this, but how do I tell my kid, Hey, we loved Wisconsin, but it's not safe for us there. Right. Because you're that state doesn't even acknowledge that you exist. How do I tell, how do you tell any woman or a fat person assigned female birth person, you get pregnant. There's some States they'll let you die on the table now. Right. Pick any other, experience you had from the undertow uh <laughs> and and tell me about it you were out there for yeah, as you said you've been out there for 20 years but um specifically you were out there for this past year you've been writing about it i, I mean i kind of want you to talk about chapter seven uh tiktok it's titled yeah uh, yeah can i read should i read the first paragraph real quick oh, yeah, yeah. evelyn <laughs> she saw shadow the forever campaign she saw shadows she always had she was spiritual not Christian, she'd left that behind when she'd left Waco in her early 20s. She got into Wicca, quote, super witchy, and said a friend, quote, she was fun, happy, a little wild, just a normal girl. I'll call her Evelyn because she's a hostage now, a captive of the beliefs that swarm any public mention of her real name. Not that she's special. She's not notorious. There are Evelyns everywhere. This Evelyn was in Austin. She was 30. She liked to party. She had a brow, a broad mountain face, girl face and forest colored eyes and her long brown hair ran to honey at the end. You're such a beautiful writer, but tell us about Evelyn. So Evelyn, I, I was fascinated and I, and I think about the sort of the slow civil war and the simmer of violence. Right. And um, I'm trying to even remember how I came across Evelyn. Um, uh, I think uh, listeners may have heard every now and then uh, these days, um, there'll be a, a horrible murder, and it's a QAnon-related murder, um, usually uh, a parent uh, killing their kids um, to save them from satanic forces. They've really gone too that far down the rabbit hole. Um, and so there's been, a, I mean, I think there's four or five that I can think of as national stories. But And this is something I learned from reporting on police brutality in, in, in my last book, right? We hear about the killings. You know what we don't hear about? All the people who get an eye shot out all the people who live with a bullet in them, they don't die. They don't make national news usually. Right. And I knew that that was going to be true with QAnon too. Evelyn didn't make national news. She barely made local news when she, this kind of hipster decides to start looking at QAnon kind of for kicks uh, when she's locked down in the pandemic. Um, But we talked about that gravitational force, that black hole pulling you in. It starts making sense. She starts, yeah, are there mental health? people say, well, there's mental health issues. Yeah, there's a lot of mental health issues in America. And and the question is, what is the contagion that latches on to it, right? For her, it was QAnon. And one day she'd had enough. She'd heard the 800,000 children. This is a con- you'll hear this cited all the time on the right. 800,000 yeah. children are abducted every year. True, except not. True in the sense that 800,000 children, something like that, are reported missing. Almost all of them are like, oh, the babysitter didn't get home in time. And so 99% of them, or maybe a parent, you know, 99% of them are fine. The numbers of actual abductions, QAnon abductions, we're talking about the 100, which is horrible, horrific. But if 800,000, if that happened, by the way, kids would be like disappearing from your school. Yeah, no, I mean, I actually, by the way, if uh, an exercise I tried a long time ago, which is uh, every time they have that Amber Amber alert, stay on top of that the next day. Google it because you can always find out because the news follows. It's almost always a custody thing. Yes. Yeah. The the, the dad took the kid from the mom illegally. 
but yeah. still it's and it's then they, and then they settle it and that's horrible and that's a problem and it's horrible it's but it's not it do, it's not the it's, it's not, not stranger danger their blood to 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 live forever there's a difference between dad says hey let's let's go to a movie and i'm not going to get you home on time and you know dark lord um but Evelyn couldn't see that difference. And right. she had this little car and she's driving around and she is just ramming it into, she sees a, a, a woman driving with her teenager. Well, a woman in a car with a kid. Obviously that kid's being abducted. She crashes, tries to crash into it, tries to crash into it. She doesn't hurt anybody. And to me, that's, that's this sort of this, um, that's the slow civil war. This, that story is called TikTok, which is, you know, is a QAnon, um, QAnon slogan. Um, it's about. It's also about the sort of the moment when Trump kind of crosses over into believing his own bullshit, and so much so that Laura Ingraham is like trying to say, "Come back to land," and he's talking about there are dark shadows. He's talking just like Evelyn. Yeah, he's, there's men in black on airplanes, and she's like, "What airplanes? Up there?" Then we say, "Oh, well, Trump's just crazy." What do you mean, just crazy? Fascism is crazy. That doesn't make it less dangerous. It's so good. It's all so good. Teens from a slow civil war available now. Congratulations on another amazing book, the reviews of it. And I, I'm always so grateful whenever you join me. Jeff Charlotte, always the best. Please keep it up and hopefully we'll do, we can do part two on this real soon. Thanks, Pete. Appreciate it. All right. There he goes. Jeff Charlotte, go get the undertow. Go let him know that you heard him here on the show. Please on Twitter at Jeff Charlotte. I appreciate all of those of you who do that each and every day. Such a great follow, such a great author, such a great American and guy and friend. Really, really like him. I also really like our second guest on today's show. She is one of the most brilliant authors, writers, journalists, speakers. I know. So, so good. I love talking to her as well. She has a great new piece at Wired Magazine. She's a journalist, a critic, an author, most recently of Magic and Lost the Internet as Art. He is the former host of Trumpcast, which is a really big, big podcast during the Trump years. She's been called one of America's preeminent cultural critics, a public intellectual for the 21st century, among the finest living writers of English prose in the New York Revenue Review of Books. And she's really outdone herself with this new piece in Wired Magazine. It's titled, I Saw the Face of God in a Semiconductor Factory. Some of the tweets from smart people. A brilliant piece of engaging reporting and writing by Virginia Heffernan. Every one of those who have visited many fabs, that's where they make the microchips, around the world, this will make a very engaging read. Even if you haven't, it does. How about this one? A crucial and poetic work of tech journalism from the always brilliant Virginia Heffernan. The semiconductor fab almost requires this treatment. Rapturous, cabalistic cyberpunk. How about this one? A must-read from Virginia Heffernan, who goes inside the TC- TSMC, the Taiwanese company at the center of the global chips industry, and pens an article that is part adventure journal, MBA case study, and geopolitical communique. Ladies and gentlemen, my latest with the great Virginia Heffernan, Heffernan on Twitter, at page 88. Let's do it right now. There she is, Virginia Heffernan. Congratulations on a wonderful piece. Thank you so much for joining me. Pete, thank you for reading it. I mean, I'm almost tempted to do one of those like namaste hands and thank you, bless you for reading it because it is, um, it's a hashtag long read, but thank you for talking, for making it through. I mean, I read it because it's you and then I didn't want to read it because the subject matter and then I couldn't stop reading it to the point where I had to go on a hike, my favorite thing to do all week. Yeah. And I didn't want to go on my hike because I was so enjoying this, which is a way of saying, if you think you, you're not going to be interested in the subject, let Virginia Heffernan sink her teeth into it. So I mean, the sub- thank you so much, Pete. And the subject is um, so boring that halfway through the word, you know, people some like get antsy, but I'll say the word semiconductor, yeah. <laughs> right? Like around the eye. You're just like, uh, I'm not going to listen to Pete this time. You know, I just can't do it. Semi, bleh. but, um, but it was such an amazing experience going to to Taiwan to see where these where people etch on atoms. Yeah, and, which is just so mind blowing. Like it almost makes the Manhattan Project look um, banal. Well, 
before we get too specific and compare it to the Manhattan Project, we need to understand exactly what that is. And it does deal with uh, some similar, I guess, technology and ideas. But the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company makes (laughs) like 92% of the world's most important, I guess, avant-garde chips the the ones that you say are in nuclear weapons, planes, submarines, missiles, on which the global balance of power is predicated. So they're not just any semiconductors. It couldn't be a less sexy name for a company, by the way, but we abbreviate it TSMC. So you went there. You somehow convinced them to let you inside. Even Nancy Pelosi didn't go inside. You had to wear a special suit to prevent the tiny dust particles that I I think are lucky enough to be uh, clinging to Virginia Heffernan from spreading themselves around the room and polluting it. And this air is as pure as we can get. Why did you want to do this and how did you get into this company? Um, Well, uh, okay, all great questions. First off, yes, the name TSMC or that abbreviation for the company sounds boring. But when you hear it in the words of Taiwanese, when the voices of Taiwanese engineers and the accent, it actually sounds like an incredibly cool, like Japanese name. So they say like TSMC, TSMC. So get it in your head as a single word, TSMC, like an MC, like you are sometimes, Pete. Um, And then you can remember it um, because it is um, such a formidable company. Not only does it make the brains basically of, you know, everything we have that has an on off switch has some kind of microchip in it. Now it not only doesn't make the, the, the chips in nuclear weapons, but it makes the chips in every single Apple product, every single Mac, every single iPhone and every single iPad. So all if TSMC chips disappeared from the face of the earth, every one of your Apple devices would be instantly bricked. You just, they're, like none of them would work. So that's, you know, that's the way that they're most known that and and actually, interestingly, the, the chips in your phone are more sophisticated than the chips in in, uh, say, nukes or hypersonic missiles. Um, they just hmm. the amazing amount that they have to accomplish in the palm of your hand is is incredible. So I had started to think about what a chip was. And I had heard at some point that in the beginning, when the thing called Moore's Law was codified that says, you know, our devices and the number of transistors you can fit on a chip, they will shrink. The transistors will shrink. The number of them that can fit on a chip will grow. And in the meantime, the cost of the device will come down. So you know how like you say, oh, I got this cool TV and someone say you should wait two years because it's going to be cheaper and smaller or thinner. And did you ever wonder, like, why don't they just make it that way now? How do they know? Always. I always think that way just about you don't have to know much just about uh, storage chips for your your photos and videos. Yes. Yes. Just, you know, wait till the next model and they're going to make it, you know, it'll be all that much better. This is a, 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 you know, a thing called Moore's Law. But of course, it's not a law. One of the people at TSMC calls it shared optimism. It's (laughs) like hope itself that that we have this idea that things have to shrink and they have to grow cheaper. And that is. That is the brain of the machines, the chip and the transistors on it have to shrink. So I started to understand that when Moore's Law was first coined, the idea that they would that these things would continue to shrink, you could fit about four transistors onto the size of your thumbnail, four transistors on there. It's pretty small. Now you can fit trillions. It's just hard to understand, and that's kind of where the crux of this article and certainly the industry is. It's hard to understand how small a thing is. It's not visible to the human eye, as you say, but it's even harder to understand how that thing could be built or manufactured with what tool. And you teach us all about it. It's actually light and then water. And we learn a history of uh, lithography. Am I pronouncing that right? Well, yeah, lithography, photo lithography, which is which is lithography with light. And yes, you are using electrons to manipulate atoms. And it's like lithography in art, right? You're just, you know, the same way that you could, um, you know, make like batik, right? It's a version of that. In fact, they used to do lithography on chips, slightly bigger chips, but with wax. And you could do it with the human eye. So 
And it's just the continuation of that process, smaller and smaller and smaller, until instead of using knives, like you might do like an art class for lithography, you are using laser beams. And laser beams have increasingly small wavelengths. So if you remember from physics, like slow wavelengths, I don't know what we're talking in right now, but radio, like traditional radio wave wavelengths are yep. slow. Microwaves are, are a little, uh, you know, a little bit uh, shorter. Then we get to the visible spectrum, Roy G. Biv, shorter still. And finally, move out. Oh, sorry, I skipped infrared, but you know, you you know the usual things. Then all the way to violet ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, they're getting shorter and shorter. So if you think about it, you know, it's just like a sharper pencil, sorry. So you can be more precise with light with shorter wavelengths, but it's also hard to work with. So it's like just getting a better and better and better knife. Um, so now they're up to using extreme ultraviolet. They used to use light in the, visu- in the visible spectrum. And long time ago, they used to use knives. So you're really just talking about cutting And the tool is light and the material is, well, silicon, as you know, and then other very arcane materials, you know, uh, synthetic materials where you're working in layers that are atoms thick and then removing some of that each time and then layering lattices of of what are transistors. There's essentially the transistors, although in some sense they're objects because they have mass or they take away mass, right? So they're objects, but there's some question about whether to call them objects because they're also just printed. Like this is just printing technology. It's the same thing you use to make a magazine. You're laying down, but the ink has a tiny, tiny bit of mass. And this has a tinier still bit of mass. So that's what a transistor is. I still don't, I'll, and I'll never understand, and I don't want you or anybody to explain how they actually do anything, how they perform. Uh, uh, but, but I. It's just a fuck ton of lasers. Like, it's just, it, like, if you want, if it's just a ton of lasers focused onto something like a knife. No, I mean, how the transistor, how the semiconductor, what, what its function is inside the iPhone. You take us, you know, through the history of, of this, and it's really interesting, and, and talk about Texas Instruments, and, and that's yeah. the guy who eventually came. Uh, and and hooked up with and started this this co- uh, company, but I knew what that thing did. It added, it did math. But now I have an iPhone, and it can do anything. And so right. the the role of the semiconductor is is somewhat not less important, but harder, even harder to understand than the manufacture of it. But but before that, yeah, take us to Taiwan. I remember when you were tweeting. I'm going on a like 17 hour flight, something maybe you'd never or certain hadn't done a long time. Yeah. And in the article you wrote about when you landed, you lost your luggage. So you had to go to a mall and get clothes, which is the, the, you're hilarious as you always are. But you also needed to learn about the history, at least of this industry and how it came to Taiwan. And I think that's one of the most interesting p- parts about this article is you teach us the history. And so you sat down with a journalist who who helped you as one of your first stops after you got a new outfit. <laughs> okay, so that you know, I lost my luggage. Kind of the airline <laughs> left Sorry, all if... the coach luggage behind um, back at back at JFK and ended up flying us nearly eighteen hours. So in a seven seventy seven, I think for a seven forty seven, it it can't it can't even no one has ever been in the air over eighteen hours because it just has to refuel. So. But why do we go so far? And I'm not blaming the airline. We went so far because we had to circumnavigate the airspace that Putin has, you know, banned Americans from or banned wet the West from in retaliation, by the way, for us banning yeah. Russians from our interesting airspace. consequence. And you write about that. The reason that so so, you know, we had to take a, a take a longer route and we had the plane had to be lighter so they left the you know coach class luggage behind in order that we could do this without refueling the reason that i bring up all that which could just be an interesting plane snafu that you would leave out of a story but the reason i bring it up is that the ukraine war casts a long shadow over taiwan because they are i think i say in the piece kind of trauma bonded sister states taiwan and ukraine they are both menaced by an, a, a neighboring authoritarian state 
that is perpetually threatening, and in the case of Russia, actually doing it, perpetually threatening to, quote, reclaim them or seize them or invade them. And when the invasion of Ukraine happened, Taiwan was terrified. Does this mean all bets are off? Does this mean that China will take this opportunity to say, well, while the EU EU and NATO and America are focused on uh, are focused on Ukraine, we're just going to take back Ukraine, which is I mean, sorry, take back Taiwan, which technically is still a Republic of China, not its own country. So there are all kinds of difficulties here. But just to get to the like, you know, earthy Virginia here to take it out of Adams and geopolitics. There's a wonderful other part of Taiwan where in ordinary life, where in the fabs, fabricators, where they make the chips, everything is hyper precise. But outside the fabs, as I discovered when I had nothing but the stuff I had slept in on my body on the plane and I was waiting for my luggage, there is no I've never been into a city, not Cleveland, not, you know, not uh, Baton Rouge, not anywhere where people cared less about how they looked. Like nobody seemed to, sh- it was like my dream grunge world. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, these, and even the people who work at the most powerful, uh, the 10th most powerful, 10th biggest company in the world, I mean, bigger than Meta, right? Bigger than Facebook, bigger than Exxon. There is no, I don't know if you've been to the Googleplex, but no. it's, it, oh, it's like Paytech Philippe's and, you know, everyone in, like everyone looks like now Jeff Bezos, like built up bodies and whatever. Ugh. These people were, to not to put too fine a point on it, but schlubs. Like, <laughs> and because I had had to buy clothes at the last minute for what I expected to be a really like important interview, right? I was like, yeah. I'm talking to the CEO. I, I need to like, what? I don't know, get a, like a 90s suit or something. Uh, but I could only find a mall store. So I got these like cotton separate sub Uniqlo, uh, old Navy, <laughs> right? And I was like, I cannot believe I'm going into this place like this. And yet that's how everyone dressed. I it think worked, it one, other, one other thing, just so that listeners can picture it. I was so prepared for that Silicon Valley, like we are not worthy as New Yorkers. Like, you know, we need to be spending 25 more years in the gym. And, you know, they get they say like, oh, can we give you some free lunch pecan rock fish and moose <laughs> lassi and, you know, whatever. So I was prepared for that. And tons of perks. You always hear about Google and perks. I go in and I say, what are the perks here? And the head of PR says, oh, no, no, we have perks. At Burger King, you get 10% off if you work at TSMC. It's it's, 10%. What even is that, Pete? Well, it seems like it's a completely different culture than is Silicon Valley. And yet it's in the same technology world to some extent. I think one thing that was I found so fascinating that you write about, that you learned about, is the, the the way that they see the American worker. There's an obvious and important discussion that needs to be had about these semiconductors being manufactured. We all learned about a lot of things about where things are made and why that matters throughout the epidemic, uh, the pandemic, where everything shut down. What did what did you learn about what they think of American engineers? And we're not we, you know, these are highly skilled workers because. The culture, this is your way, one way of many of describing the different cultures in terms of work, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of the glitz and glamour that may or may not exist in this industry. And it seems like it doesn't there. You know, I left, as you say, I left, you know, one of my early trips after travel restrictions eased up. And in fact, they, they we were still quarantining and everybody was wearing masks in October um, in Taiwan. But you know, I arrived there after understanding the stuff about the supply chain uh, that you pointed out, the stalls in the supply chain. What I had on my mind was like Elon Musk and social media. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, Peter Thiel and Musk and maybe Mark Zuckerberg still, these are the great t- tech companies of the world. What tech companies do is you have like a preening founder who shows up to like, you know, tr- tr- like, throw punches on Twitter and then gets married 10 times or has 25 kids. And like, he's married to Grimes and you follow him (laughs) like a gossip thing. Right. And I was like, I sort of remember when engineers were more like actual Tesla or actual Edison. And they just were like in their workshop all the time, but it's been a long time. And now I think of these people as tabloid figures who are just like, you know, consider themselves galaxy brains, but we don't really know 
what, what, what their intelligence, you know, how to measure their intelligence or how to see evidence of their intelligence. Then I meet entirely different, like the absolute dream of if your kid decided to be an engineer would not be like, oh, they're going to get a good job and make a living. It would be that they had found an absolute passion and a passion that you could see in the face of the CEO, Mark Liu, of, as I say, in, in many, by many measures, the 10th richest company in the world, you know, your stock billionaire who runs a huge company. And all he wants to talk about is what it's like to think like an atom. And like tears come to his eyes and he has religious faith, which shocked me. He says, all scientists must believe in God and to work at that company he, or, or in general. Uh, he said all scientists must believe in God, that his engineers, I mean, I don't, he doesn't make the catechize them, you know, and the founder of TSMC is an atheist. Right. But I think he thinks that you default believe in God if you've ever looked under a scanning electron microscope and seen the extraordinary beauty, and I haven't of how electrons, protons, neutrons, uh, a nucleus um, work to get like how, you know, how much, how much uh, dead space there is in seemingly solid objects or how much movement there is. All the original discoveries of atomic physics are just to him such a kind of astonishment. I have never seen, certainly not among the CEOs, the, you know, of the world, the level of wonder, just childlike wonder yeah. on his face as he contemplated um, the fact of the simple fact of atoms when you, or when the you, simple fact of silicon. They, I mean, they just. But when you're writing about when you're writing about it, it made me think that it's to him and to those who do look at them through microscopes. And we've seen them illustrated in Hollywood, you know, in, in, in films and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the the nanoverse, I think. Yes. It's, yes. It, like to me, that's. It made me think of just though being in a in a beautiful idyllic place in, in nature on the side of a mountain or or watching a sunset. To some, it sounds yeah. like the exact same thing. It's just the the nanoverse. Yes, and what and and you know, I said to one of the other um, extraordinary scientists there, Bern Jang Lin, you know, Mark Liu seems to see God in atoms. What about you? And he said, I can see God at any scale. You don't even have to go that far. Then he rhapsodized about water and the refractive index of water, which is a whole other issue. Yeah. And then he said, but look at animals, but look at, you know, and so, and he said, or look into the, you know, you can go big, you can look through a, through a telescope, right? Not just a, an electron microscope. So it is the same thing that you said, but it had just been a long time since I had heard a kind of deist describe nature describes sort of some kind of sacredness of of nature itself. And, you know, I think they were edging toward a kind of intelligent design idea. At the same time, they certainly, there's no politics to it. And they certainly like wouldn't reject evolution. They're scientists. But, it, you know, at some point he said, the face of God is the face of nature. And all I bring all this up to say the heavy motivation to pursue atoms to their hiding places is so different from what American engineers are inculcated into that American engineers see TSMC, which I came to see as a sacred space, these fabricators as a sweatshop. They see these engineers as doing this demeaning work. They see American engineers, and this is like kind of glass door gossip, but engineers at TSMC, Taiwanese engineers, uh, South Asian engineers see American engineers as babies who have no curiosity, no stamina, stamina, no sense of wonder, who just want to punch the clock and, you know, don't want to do the extraordinary work of making these atomic constructions. And it, it's, it would be hard for me to bridge that gap if I were trying to get the new TSMC fab in Phoenix, Arizona off the ground to, it's not a work ethic so much as like crack the whip. It's a work ethic so much as like, you know, like you with politics, you would do this even if you didn't get paid for it. We both have done this, even if we did. So it's it's like, how do you teach that kind of completely arbitrary passion for 
a certain kind of practice in the world. And I, you know, unless you believe almost religiously in enlightenment principles, that, you know, it that the world is this onion skin problem that you you might like perpetually try to understand. You don't, I don't know how to teach that. I don't know how to be in an engineering school and say, this is not about a paycheck. This is not, this has to be about a, an almost all consuming curiosity to understand. It's got to be something like that. You write about Morris Chang, who you talked to. He's a, he was trained as an engineer at MIT and Stanford. Stanford. He, he uh, founded TSMC in 1987. You say he's long maintained that American engineers are less curious and fierce than their counterparts in Taiwan. At a think tank forum in Taipei in 2021, Morris Chang shrugged off competition from Intel, declaring, quote, no one in the United States is as dedicated to their work as in Taiwan. That's interesting. It's about dedication as well, I I guess, which is. I I should say, I did not talk to Morris Chang, the founder of the company. He's in his 90s and he is an incredible person, but I couldn't. I I talked to the CEO instead of to instead of to uh, Dr. Chang. Dr. Chang grew up, came up in the humanities. He likes to think about I mean, he's just an amazing businessman. And Chris Miller and Chip War has really chronicled this well. But Part of the reason that the Taiwanese, as Morris Chang was building TSMC, part of the reason that he is was so formidable and part of the reason that it's important to him, the Taiwanese, that the island of Taiwan has this legendary uh, commitment to atomic constructions, to making these chips, is that this is where we get to geopolitics. Yeah. In order for Taiwan to survive, the leadership made a commitment at the time they brought Morris Chang over from TI, from Texas Instruments, they made a commitment to making Taiwan indispensable to the United States so that we would have to rely on them. And the fact that they make the brains for all of Apple products means that America is never going to cut them loose because the biggest company in the world, the, the, the prize of the United States now, Apple, and the well-being and GDP of the country relies on chips from this really small island in Asia. And it, it explicitly, the leadership and the, uh, uh, you know, the president and the government of Taiwan and Morris Chang sat together and said, we're going to lose Taiwan off the face of the earth if we keep just making umbrellas, which is what they made in the 70s. We need to make something, anything that the world can't live without. And they settled on chips. And this is a place with no oil resources. It's not like Saudi Arabia ha- happens on oil oil reserves or Texas. And thus, oh, everyone needs us. We can run, we can, you know, have an oligopoly. We can do all these things. We can hold the whole world by the short and curlies, as my friend says. Um, but, um, but Taiwan had to come up with something and what they decided to do was just become the masters of chips and slowly, 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 while we've been over here being like, oh, maybe Snapchat is the most important thing or Tumblr or whatever, they have be- <laughs> gotten a 92% market share on the world's most advanced chips. Like Elon Musk can flex and spend his money on whatever he wants and his 25 kids and Grimes while they will slowly get a 92% monopoly on advanced chips that is a business success to beat the band it's an indispensable product that they created that protects the country's future and freedom that's right what you're referring to is called the silicon shield um and that's how the chips end up being the protection and people refer to tsmc as the sacred mountain of protection sometimes it means the sacred mountain of protect of the protection of taiwan And sometimes it means the sacred mountain of protection of democracy. Why? Here's a stupid question. I don't even think you answered this or attempted to answer this because it's so stupid. But I'm asking anyway, how come China doesn't just invade Taiwan and not touch that factory? Because they want that ability to manufacture. Everybody wants that ability. So why don't why doesn't China just go in and say, listen, you guys are autonomous. You you keep doing your thing. TCMC. We're not we're not going to do anything, but we, we run the show. Okay, that is the op- absolute opposite of a dumb question. That is the question. That is the question she is asking asking himself. That is the question that America thinks about all the time. And the answer is very simple and, and very elegant. TSMC 
would itself be bricked if an authoritarian country tried to come in. And here's why. TSMC requires the most intricate, and here's we get where we get into the supply chain, collaboration of what our Secretary of State Tony Blinken calls the rules ba- rules based or- world order, it, free, formerly the free world, right? Mostly, almost exclusively democracies, but democracies from Dominican Republic to Japan to uh, to New Zealand to the United States to every country in Europe um, to some countries in Africa are part of this. And if you can't get those people on the phone, it's like, um, you know, I don't know, maybe it's like someone stealing someone's husband, but the person doesn't, you know, just killing the wife, stealing the husband and the children, and then saying, now love me and act like a family, right? Like the thing that they want, that China wants is the thing it absolutely can't get, which is this rich, these rich sense of connections without which the fabs don't work. Some people call the fabs the porcupine. Like you get right. try to get your hands on it, it's done. Mark Liu, the CEO, says uh, if you try to uh, lay siege to the fabs, they become inoperative. They just don't work. There is it's it's like the most. I I, I have to say it's it gave me the most hope for democracy because it's like a tautology. Like if you're not a democracy, you can't be a democracy, and if you can't be a democracy, you can't have. Uh, you can't participate in the in these um, networks and in the world's arguably most valuable resource. Well explained. Very well explained. And you did explain that as well in in the article as well, I should say. Um, all right. I'm going to let you go. And we barely scratch the surface. This is one of the most interesting and important articles I've read in a very long time. And everybody else is saying that that's read it. And everybody should go read it on Wired. Of course, it's linked in the show notes. Before I let you go. You, of course, were the host of a very popular podcast uh, for a while, Trump Cast, uh, and you're still interested in talking about him. And I am happy that you are because I think your perspective matters. Uh, where do you think we're at with all these inquiries into him? Uh, and you've been paying, obviously, pretty close attention to it as well. We're talking here on Wednesday afternoon. So far, he's not been indicted, Virginia. Um, You know. I'd like to see him indicted like any sane person wants, just because you always want the immune system of the Republic to rally. And, you know, when you think of all these people, when you think of everyone in our like sea to shining sea penal colony who are like, (laughs) you know, like sitting in jail for, for minor crimes or sitting in jail for way too long or sitting in jail for crimes they didn't even commit. You cannot believe that the crime syndicate that is the one man crime syndicate that's Donald Trump has slipped the knot for now decades. And so some idea that, oh, you know, I think he said today, I want to go to jail. I want to get shot, right? I think he's thinking of like, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald or what was like, you he know, said I, that I wanna, today? Uh, what is that? I didn't know that he said something like that. Yes, he said today, I want to be perp walked. I want to be in handcuffs and I want to be shot because then I'll be a martyr. And, you know, people started to say, because we take Trump so seriously, that, oh, yeah, like, you know, I was just on a panel last night and someone said yesterday was a good day for Donald Trump because he got the news cycle. You know what? Nobody wants to go to jail and nobody wants to get shot. Right. If he wants suicide by cop or suicide by the deep by deep state cop, that is another thing. And he wants to be a martyr for the cause. But it, I, we can't take if he's suicidal. Like, right. That's a whole different thing. But he does not want to be shot and he doesn't want to go to jail. And he will tell us that he wants that. As you know, Eugene Carroll did not charge him with rape for a long time on the grounds that, well, he'll just if people will like it, he'll just get elected. This is how we defeat our spirits. We start saying, oh, he always skates. You know, he always skates or he'll turn it into something. Or if if someone shot him on Fifth Avenue, everyone would still love him and he'd be happy because he'd be a martyr. No, the system needs to rally. We need to send a signal to the to the we need to send a signal through one of these courts that this will not stand. We have like a rampant criminal who sat in the Oval Office, who commanded uh, his followers to sack the U.S. Capitol And he is still a free man. And, uh, you know, I don't care what he says. I don't care if it is the best day for him. If he's Charlie Manson and he's going to, like, laugh all the way through a long prison sentence, fine. What do you say to those who say that 
okay, I, I hear you. I, I feel the same way. But this charge being first, you know, the hush money payment, really, it, do, it doesn't really sound like that that big of a crime. What do you say to that? Um, I mean, a crime is a crime, right? Like, the, like what he did with Stormy Daniels is appalling, and it's the kind of thing that like people who in, were in jail for two joints, you know, are are like that's appalling. That's horrible. Like during the campaign, he paid off a woman to be silent and then lied like hell about it. I mean, that's the, um, you know, that's the like ordering, uh, suborning perjury from Michael Cohen. Like that's the, he told him to lie thing that like, yeah. you know, the Mueller report touched on, touched on or got into is, is that part of things. I mean, this is just like white collar malfeasance, that is so dispiriting to people to think that there's a class of white men who get away with appalling stuff that we have laws that regulate. I mean, of course, like I wish that he had, you know, been in or I wish the, the, he'd been uh, indicted for obstruction of justice, the 12 counts of obstruction of justice detailed in the Mueller report. I wish he'd gone to jail for discrimination, housing discrimination in 1975, Mm -hmm. but. Or many, any of his sexual assaults. Any of his sexual assaults. And, and, uh, you know, hopefully we have some of that trickling up the, uh, you know, trickling up the chain, but you know, this at the heart of this is someone treating women, including pregnant Melania Trump or, and, and and Melania Trump with Barron as a newborn with complete, like brutal ritual humiliation by sleeping with Stormy Daniels and then covering it up as if he can get away with anything. If this is this technicality about campaign finance, I still think we're t- thinking about all the ways that our traumatized electorate and the traumatized American citizenry needs to be sent a signal that no one is above the freaking law. Right. Like we can say it and tire, tire ourselves out all we want, but all we've learned so far from tr- the efforts to uh, bring tr- Trump to justice is someone is above the law. But maybe someday that will stop. And I hope it's as soon as possible. Virginia Heffernan, thank you very much. So grateful. So great to see you. Great to talk to you. This article is so, so good. And uh, I hope to see you and talk to you again soon. Thank you. Pete, thank you so much. All right. That's what I did with my Wednesday, amongst other things. Also went for the hike in the woods. Saw my daughter play her first high school lacrosse game and uh, edited a pilot for a new show that I'm working on here for stand-up listeners uh, that I can't talk about yet, but it's one of your favorite guests is going to maybe do a little little contribution here of his own. We'll see what happens. But busy day for me and very productive, a lot of fun talking to both Jeff Charlotte and Virginia Heffernan. If you listen to both those interviews, uh, consider yourself a lot smarter, a lot more in the know, a lot more understanding. I really enjoyed both those interviews. And if you did, please sign up for a subscription if you haven't already. You can always pay more if you want, more than five bucks, but five bucks is the minimum. Sign up. You could be a part of our community and join us at tonight's Hangout. That's the Thursday night Hangout every Thursday at 8 East. Can't do it without you. Thanks so much for your support. And I'll talk to you right here tomorrow with the new president of the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, someone who's become a really close personal confidant of mine over the years. Really excited to catch up with her on the record. Allison Jaslow joins me. Also scheduled to talk to the great Kevin Richberg, who's a longtime listener and usually joins us at the Hangout. Love Kevin about his life and more importantly, or even equally or as interesting uh, farming, gardening. We're going to do a series of conversations, potentially answering your questions about that. So if you've got any questions about how to grow things, send them my way for Kevin. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. That's it. That's all. John Carroll, take us out. Pete Coe, thank you. Adessa Son, my intern, thank you. I'll talk to you tomorrow right here on Stand Up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down. Oh, you better stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with.
love and cause us for laws and sins that weren't even sin. They knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up Alright, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 